Uh, you're listening to Jewels and Bullets, the You Are My Discography podcast, a show where a You Are My fan and a You Are My super fan discuss each of the band's records. I'm Tommy Waite, an Aussie writer and podcaster who's based out of Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm the You Are My fan in this equation. My co-host and You Are My super fan is Sydney-based John O'Duncan, the host of the Progressive Rugby League podcast and general man about town, John O. How the bloody hell are you? Hey Tommy, I'm I'm really well. I'm pretty excited too. So uh, let's get, let's get stuck in straight away. I'm so pumped. Let's uh, do this. I, can I just clarify? I am a super fan, but not the super fan. I just uh, want to put a caveat out there, but very excited to be here. Yeah, there there is a super the super fan walking around. Uh, very proud Somewhere. of his title. And uh, yeah, if you start trying to claim that from him or her. Or they, then perhaps there might be an issue. So I'm glad exactly. you kind of uh, you you squared the ledger immediately. So today in episode one, we're talking sound as ever. The first LP from You and I from 1993. Uh, but before we get stuck into the record, a quick disclaimer: myself and Jono are in no way affiliated to You and I. We're just two fans talking music for the love of the game. Uh, if you found this show, there's a good chance you're already familiar with the group known as You Are My. But if not, listen to their records, go to their shows, send them all your money and love. They bloody deserve it. Uh, anything to add, John? I'm not a I'm not a trained lawyer, but I feel like that pretty much covers uh, covers us from a legal perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, th- this show really is just um, a show of enthusiasm towards a band that we love and has uh, given us a lot. So we hope uh, to sort of just talk about the songs that we love and, and the stories behind it and our experiences growing up with UMI. Uh, that's where I'm coming from anyway. So I'm interested in, in how it's all unfolded for you too. Amen to that. Sharing the love. So yep. format for the show will be – what we're going to do in episode one, we'll give a quick bit of background on how myself and Jono became you and my fans. Uh, and then we'll go into sound as ever a little, you know, a few notes on what led up to the recording of the record. Then we'll go through the record track by track. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about what happened after the album dropped. Uh, so, that's pretty much the show. That'll be the mm. format, unless something changes. Um, so let's get stuck in. Jono, the ref's blown the whistle, mate. Tell me, how did you become a UMI fan? Well, before I get to that, Tommy, I want to start with, just to extend on what I was saying before, and talk about what kind of fan I am. Because, I, like I said, I'm not the super fan, but I am a UMI super fan. And I would say UMI are probably my favorite band. I don't like using that term because, you know, I'm not 12. And as I've grown (laughs) older, there's, you know, heaps of bands that I think are amazing, but undoubtedly they're the band that mean the most to me and the band that really kind of got me interested in music uh, at a deeper level, I guess. And, you know, deeper than just singing along to the radio. So I would consider myself a super fan, not the super fan. There are people out there that would know a lot more than me about the band and have a lot more kind of musical savvy than me and and get the linkages and references better than me. Like my my knowledge of music is actually pretty limited, but to give listeners a sense of the kind of fan I am, you know, um, I'm kind of the guy where friends and family will text me when you or my or or Timmy is in the news or on the radio or something. I, you know, I've obviously obsessed over their records, every single one of them, as well as all the equally brilliant Roger's solo collection, which we'll no doubt touch on throughout the series. So there's literally thousands of hours there, but perhaps most pertinently, the the following anecdote might give you a sense of the kind of fan I am. So <laughs> most blokes who have been through adolescence will tell you that the most embarrassing thing possible uh, is to get caught by your dad masturbating, right? It's a It's a horrific experience, but I would say... <laughs> These folks have never had their dad catch them rocking out in their rumpus room with unlikely intensity, playing Rogers like air guitar, you know, a very specific type of movement full of expression and bounce and using a doorknob as a microphone to kind of whisper scream into. I can't actually do a rock scream, so it's always like a whisper scream. And and, and so I should add, I'm, I'm legally an adult at this point. I'm probably 19 or 20, um, maybe the, the Dress Me Slowly era. So I'm 
I'm here. I'm thinking I'm alone, just spasming all over the room. And of course, like sidling up to the doorknob at all the right moments. And then I catch out of the corner of my eye, my, my dad <laughs> slowly backing his way out of the room with the most confused look <laughs> on his beautiful Italian face. Uh, we've never spoken of it, but I've no doubt it was a, a source of awkwardness between us for months uh, beyond that. So anyway, that, that little anecdote probably describes my UMI uh, slash Tim Rogers fandom. Um, I, I feel it like not much else. So hopefully that gives listeners a bit of a sense. I'll, perhaps I'll, I'll let you go into how you got into UMI from here, Tommy, and then I'll, I'll get into to how I got into them specifically. But um, hopefully that, that kicks us off with the, the kind of fan I am. I think that's a, that's definitely a good start, and um, you know, let's be honest with the the listeners up front, Jono. That Jono does have five years on me. He's uh, yep. he's been he's been walking around this uh, God's good earth five <laughs> years longer than I have, and um, I think that's important in, in relation to this podcast because uh, the flimsy premise that I came up with uh, when I was making a coffee the other morning was like, all right. Jono's a super fan. I'm a fan. Why is that? And I think it's I think it's got something to do with the half a decade he's got on me. Hear me out, mm. folks. Um, <laughs> so I grew up in the early years of of high school when you're kind of ripe for the picking uh, in terms of some record executive in Los Angeles, thinking, "How the fuck am I going to get this?" kids pocket money out of him um i i I came in when i was 13 or 14 to the kind of uh, rock is back era championed by the strokes the vines jet the hives the white stripes um and it was honestly when i think in relation to umi it was off the back of that that got Mm -hmm. me into umi because i started listening to all those bands um i was yeah right for the picking it worked Lo- fell in love with those uh, that music and the, those bands in that era. But then I recall, I think it might have been Jet or, or Craig Nichols from The Vines referencing UMI and saying how important mm. they were. And so I recall it was one Christmas where a family friend were asking my parents, what should I get Tommy for Christmas? One of those situations where they were coming over for the the second lunch on Christmas day or whatever. And there was going to be some, some uh, gifts exchanged. So um, yeah, I said, I'll get me the cream and the crock because yeah. it was advertised at the time. And I'm ashamed to say they got, they got, they got it for me and I wanted to like it, but it went over my head at the time. Can I, can I just ask Tom, did they get you the double album version or the, yes. the single album version? I oh, got yeah, the cream yeah. and the croc. Nice. Yeah, good. I think they were a bit disappointed. They were like, fuck, 40 bucks from Sanity <laughs> just for uh, for a 5 out of 10 turkey dinner. Uh, probably reheated. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so that was that was what first got me into it. And it was one of those situations where I really wanted to like it, but I think my musical palette wasn't that advanced yet. So that was kind of like me um entering the realm but it really yeah. was I'd, I'd say convicts was the yeah. record that that grabbed me because then that was like six or so years later first year of university i saw umi perform live at metro's Fremantle, pretty good live uh pretty mm. good venue for live music and um it was a great show and great record it kind of um that was kind of like a reawakening for them, I think. I guess we'll get yeah. we'll, we'll discuss that when we get to it. But anyway, at that point, I was like, "Oh, I'm in," and yeah. I get it. I get it now. My yeah. palate had advanced, and then I went back. I was so fucking happy I had that double album, so I could go back and be like, "Oh, this is these are the hits. These are the kind yeah. of like the slightly different ones, but maybe better than the hits in some ways." And yeah. so from that point, I was on. I was in, but I I don't think they got their talons in me as early as your good self perhaps or yeah 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 well i'm looking forward to when we get to that point of that rock is back era because that was a really interesting time so i guess we'll get to that point around sort of the dress me slowly era but um for me this will sound like i'm making this up but honestly this is true hearing a umi song in my brother's car when i was 15 years old changed the trajectory of my life <laughs> i really think it did now the year was 1998 and so you and i had recently released their fourth album 
the number four record. So similar to you, Tommy, I wasn't there from the beginning. Um, and so they just released their number four record, but I was none the wiser. I, I really had no idea. Uh, I think I think I knew of them, but I, I wasn't in that world. Um, I, how do I put this, Tommy? I grew up listening to commercial shock bot, <laughs> commercial shock jock talkback radio. My uh, my folks loved the two UE shock jockery, and it's embarrassing but true. But as a kid, I, I think I, I kind of loved it too. I think it was mainly the sport. I was obsessed with sport, but I listened to kind of anything and everything on that wacky station. And it truly was wacky and that, and it hasn't changed over, over these years. I think it's 2GB now. Anyway, and so that was the kind of audio I mainly consumed. And I also started listening to a bit of Triple M as I reached my teens, like my cousin and my bro, they loved two, uh, they loved U2 and, and Dire Straits and stuff like that. So I guess from a musical perspective, that's kind of where I was at in my early teens. But this day in my, my brother's white Ford laser bubble back was kind of the line in the sand from which I never crossed back from. It, it was all very gradual, of course, but I do think like that was a moment that changed my life in a way. Um, I was in the 10th grade at school uh, doing work experience at a real estate agent in Carlingford in the, uh, in the burbs of Sydney. It's like a horrible last minute placement. And I was kind of feeling super down and I guess super sensitive. And my brother would have been about 20 and we were in his car. He was taking me to the real estate agent and he had Triple J breakfast on. I think it was like Paul McDermott and Mikey Robbins, and I'd never really heard them. And then you, um, you and Mike came on with Heavy Heart on the radio, and it just hit my kind of wussy little heart out of the ballpark in a lot of ways. Like, in a lot of ways, it's a very conventional song, but I'd never heard anything like it. Um, it just felt like just the perfect song. I guess I, I was used to like a sheen in my music, I guess, from listening mm. to big bands on Triple M. And then this song just came on. It just sounded so humble and sweet. And I don't think I've ever felt, what well, to that point, I'd ever felt such a close proximity to a song. So it just kind of felt really up close to me. And so that song got me through that day, and I sung it all day. And then from there, it was just a gradual process. My brother had that album at home and, and all the UMI albums to that point. So that was important. And at first... I just go downstairs where the stereo was in our house and just listen to Heavy Heart, um, and then I'd I'd sort of expand just to listen to Heavy Heart and Rumble, which is the next song on that album, and then another song and then another song until I got through the whole album, and then I went to Alley Daily, then Hi-Fi Away and Sound as Ever. So I basically went backwards from from number four to get to Sound as Ever, and so through my love of UMI, I guess I became I guess a Triple J guy. They, they were the only ones playing them from what I could see at the time. And, and then I got into music more generally. And I guess I might have become the person I am with, with or without you and I, but you know, who knows? In my mind, that was the turning point. Um, I don't know how it changed things, but to at least a, a decent extent, events unfolded the way they have for me, for better or worse, due to you and I. There you have it. There you have it. Um, yeah, I, I could go off into a million tangents in terms of similarities, differences with the, you know, m my kind of experiencing them at, in Fremantle that time. But I think we're going to – all in good time. I think we're going to yeah. get there. Um, but I think that gives a pretty good overview of where we're coming at this from. And I'm excited about this journey, man, because mm. I'm going to be able to, like uh, – get this information that I need. You're, you're, you're the kind of, uh, fingers crossed, if you've actually been paying attention as opposed to just listening to Heavy Heart on repeat for the last 20 <laughs> years, um, I'm going to be able to get, a, get kind of like the upgraded advanced version of Wikipedia here and be able to kind of um, yeah. get all the, all the extra stuff. So uh, let's start at the beginning. And uh, obviously it is in the beginning. There were EPs mm. prior to Sound As Ever, Mm. And um, perhaps if this thing's a fucking raging success, we can go back and sideways into Rogers. Or I'm already thinking of of the tangents and the and the oh, side yeah. projects and all that. But to keep things very simple, we're just gonna go through all the LPs in order. So we're not gonna dwell too much on this because, yeah, let's face it. Uh, anyone who's listening to this is a you are my sad sack as, as well as as much as us. So. But anyway, just just kind of the the bare bones details. 
It was released October 25, 1993. The label was Ra Records. It was recorded in rural Cannon Falls, Minnesota over eight days uh, from July to August 1993. So I guess the middle of the year and then it came out, um, you know, like three or four months later. It was produced by Lee Ronaldo of Sonic Youth fame with Wayne Connolly as mixer and audio engineer. And that name jumped out at me um, because he worked with the Vines. Uh, and I believe it was kind of like a, uh, the Vines wanted him because he'd been attached with uh, UMI. And um, yeah, it produced three singles, Adam's Ribs, Bell and Chair, and Jamie's Got a Gal. Um, so mm. there's tons of stuff that anyone could wiki about this record. But in terms of kind of like the album coming together, Super fan, Jono, do you feel like mm. there's anything pertinent about kind of the formation of the band or the early EPs that's um, necessary that we discuss uh, in relation to Sound As Ever? Oh, uh, look, not really. I guess there's we could just have a, a quick scene set of like, like you've given. We could probably say that, you know, UMI was, was born in, in 1989 in Sydney, there were three parents. There was Jamie Rogers, Tim's bro on drums, I think, Nick Tischler on bass, and, and Tim, Jamie's bro, on guitar and, and singing. Um, I think Mark Tunnelly replaced Jamie Rogers soon enough. Uh, I think that's when they released an EP, Snake Tide, before Andy Kent replaced Nick Tischler on bass. And I think there were two more EPs, Goddamn and Coprolalia, before Sounders ever came out. So... Um, and I, I will get to this towards the end of the show, but Mark, Mark Tunnelly departed as drummer of the band just before Sound As Ever was released, and, and Russell Hopkinson replaced them, and Rusty Andy and Tim were the trio uh, for that band until the late 90s when, when Davey Lane joined them um, at their live album, Saturday Night Round 10. And from there, that's been the four of them. So that's a, a bit of a, a primer, but yeah, all on Wiki if you really need it, but um, I think that gives us a bit of context and one thing I was curious about, perhaps you know, uh, how did they get hooked up with Ronaldo? Was it a kind of mm. – were they hyping? I, I appreciate that you weren't yeah. following the, the band at the time, but, like, have you ever found out, like – because this – it seems like he was kind of the perfect guy to record this album and seems like somewhat of a coup for them to be able to, yeah. you know, because Ronaldo was recording Nirvana immediately prior to UMI coming mm. in. So had, mm. do you have any idea of kind of like what the, the UMI hype train was looking like after the initial EPs? Yeah. Like you say, I, I was a, a, a few years younger than my brother who was the prime sort of generation for for you and my fans he was kind of like um yeah born in the late 70s i guess so, so that age so i was born in the the earlyish 80s um so i wasn't around that point but i've i've gleaned snippets over the years so from reading you know the the liner notes to sound as ever's super unreal edition <laughs> rusty uh writes a, a great little snippet around how you and my work kind of clearly the the next big thing in the in the scene like you could tell that they were like an amazing live band uh, had an amazing sort of singer and and guitarist and uh, they were just you know f an explosive force live and and ha clearly had songwriting chops so so I think there was something there uh, I've I think I've read that that Tim or someone associated with Tim sort of just wrote a a letter to Lee Ronaldo and sort of asked if he'd you know, what, do you, what does he think? And, you know, would you consider sort of, you know, working together or something like that? Something along those lines. I'm not 100% sure, but I think uh, it was as simple as that, that um, I think UMI got some kind of local label deal and through that uh, they got in touch with, with Lee Ronaldo, which is a huge get, but at the same time, mm -hmm. I guess, a similar sensibility um, of like not necessarily like a, a mainstream producer but like you know looking for good guitar interesting guitar music so yeah that's that's what i know oh <laughs> uh, interesting yeah no i yeah. think that all makes sense and it's it's uh they obviously it was kind of self-directed it seems like they knew that he was the guy they wanted and they were able to get him yeah maybe yeah so cool all right let's let's transition into the track so 
coprolalia. Um, and and you might be able to clarify this, but uh, that was a, the title of an earlier EP. But I don't believe the cop coprolalia appears on that earlier EP. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure to be honest. I don't I don't have that EP. But um, yeah, it's what I can say about it is I didn't actually know what coprolalia meant. <laughs> um, I just thought it was a fancy word that sort of Tim made up. I only realized it, it, it was kind of, it means like the, it's the screaming for, form of Tourette's. I only realized yeah. that like um, a few weeks ago. <laughs> um, yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, as, as someone who came into UMI at the number four record, this, I never really fully appreciated what an amazing start to their, you know, debut album this song is. It's just like a song of absolute authority you know and mm. um because i was working backwards from number four like i got to it fourth and i was like oh yeah this is a pretty good song but as we were kind of preparing for this um i've listened to it a few times and it's just it's actually if it's possible grown on me over the last few weeks um yeah what do you reckon about it yeah i i think that one thing that always kind of puzzled me with this record because i associated umi with kind of uh the mod move like the in uh, mm. the who and the small faces and kind of like the the very direct obvious references on hourly daily and hi-fi way and number four record of that mm. kind of era of um music and so it always kind of puzzled me in respect to kind of their association with grunge a little bit being like right. with that was that something that was kind of an organic organic type of songs that the band would have written anyway mm. or was it a sense of like nirvana a huge pearl jam a big let's write a tune that kind of um yeah, it's is in that ballpark to kind of yeah. get us at the door type of thing. But I feel like you know re listening to this song in a more focused way uh, for this podcast, it made me think that yeah, it is kind of like a I I felt because I read uh, Detours the Tim mm. Rogers book recently, any any references the Aerosmith influence and how he likes the early Aerosmith albums. Yeah, and right. and yeah. I think that I, I can definitely hear some type of Aerosmith influence with um the vocals. I don't think Tim Sims sings anything like Steven Tyler, but just in mm. terms of the phrasing and 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 I guess the the, the way they complement the guitar. I think that mm. yeah it, it kind of and and also Berlin Chair as well and we'll talk about that in a moment. But it made me realize that oh this is definitely not something that they were kind of doing to fit a trend. They mm. were kind of like of it, it, their influences kind of spewed out and it sounded like this. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So I, I just, um, and, and obviously the, the lyrical content, um, because I'd read detours, mm. uh, very recently it did, it, it, it seems to be kind of almost like a direct diary entry reference to, Tim's issues when he was studying, right? And, and yeah. being socially isolated and feeling kind of awkward and um yeah, just just weird like, around other people during that era and the lyrics yeah. seem to reflect that. Yeah, and and being put on, I think, you know, antipsychotic meds, which which I think proved problematic. So I think um that song, yeah, like you say, is a direct reference to that. And yeah, musically I would also say that, um, yeah, I know I've read about um, Tim's time, I think, in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, where they were sort of kicking around and having, having fun. And, and you know, Nirvana was, was an enormous uh, influence on everyone. I think I remember him saying, like, they were trying to get into, like, a, a Nirvana show um, in Sydney in the either the early 90s, I guess. And um, I think it's, for us in our generation, we're just – just um, after that period, it's hard to kind of uh, comprehend what an enormous influence they were at that time. I, I kind of have a, a bit of a sense. I was like, I don't know, 10 or 12. So I, I kind of, a lot of friends were sort of getting into it. I, I didn't quite uh, grasp it, but you could kind of sense the, the groundswell. So undoubtedly that kind of scene would have influenced anyone 
who like guitar music and uh and so there's probably an element of that as well in in that song and, and, and the record apparently according to someone online the version with tex perkins is good a yeah. bit it's the bonus disc on convicts is it yeah. can you attest to that you, maybe that was the super fan uh can I you, can you super fan. <laughs> well listen super fan i thought yeah it's a good um it's a good version uh that was a bonus disc where you and i played um a show with all guest vocalists and yeah texted an amazing screaming version of uh coprolalia I, i'd attest to that for sure yeah and, and i think it was just it's definitely a very strong start to the record and it was kind of um it's it's a very i'd, I'd say this is very a, a, a young man's kind of record and you can tell like a young band made this album in, mm. a, in a good way lots of energy and yeah it kind of it definitely a, a this this song initiated and the other songs um continued the feeling of kind of nostalgia for that era of where which i think is lost now where mm. there was kind of like party albums and um mm. stuff that you'd play on at the background and you'd maybe like get through it and then play it again and and i think that this is kind of like a yeah a very fitting opening to it to yeah. what was going to come next so all right that's track one uh number two the biggie mm. berlin chair all right let's try and say something interesting that hasn't <laughs> been said prior yeah. how do we do well, that well, I'll give it a go. Like, uh, it's it's good actually that we're doing this podcast in this format because we can get stuck into one of the big boys straight away. So it's it's worked out really nicely. Berlin Chair. Uh, you know, it, how do I put it? Firstly, I'd say, as someone who came to UMI through Number Four Record, the first version I really got into of it was from the Number Four Record bonus disc, the Radio Sete uh, live album, which is live at the Wireless, and Tim does an acoustic version of Berlin Chair, which I think is just amazing. And so the first several years of my UMI fandom, I, that was the version that I loved the most. Um, and it wasn't uh, until, I don't know, a couple of years later, I don't know, just I eventually got it. I go, oh, yes, I understand. Because like, I knew Berlin Chair was the song that everyone loved and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but I never, I always preferred the acoustic version. But then um, eventually, you know, inevitably the the main version just absolutely killed me and it's mm. just an amazing song i think the firstly if you wait i'll give all all my aches to you is just um, an amazing line uh but i i originally thought it was eggs i'll give all my eggs to you and you know when you get a lyric wrong <laughs> but then you kind of try to justify no it would have been eggs because you know you know you put all your eggs in a basket you know you can't put all your eggs in one basket, but maybe Tim did. And then he gave all his eggs from that basket to that person. So like, so I got the lyrics wrong. It's, it's an that. Easter egg hunt gone wrong, gone terribly <laughs> yeah, so. wrong. And, and you know, I've got a, I've got a little anecdote here. I want to just add in uh, yeah, yeah. from my online trolling. Um, so the, the song bell and chair was featured in the Australian drama series upright, uh, from 2019 okay. written by Chris Taylor of the chase of fame. Uh, during season one's episode five, the appearance references a common misunderstanding of the lyrics to Berlin Chair. In the episode, a character listens to Berlin Chair while driving a car and repeatedly skips the song backwards as she tries to decipher a word in the song's chorus. The character really? initially thinks that the lyrics are, if you wait, I'll give all my eggs to you, before later realizing that Rogers, in fact, in fact sings, I'll give all my eggs to you. So. Right. There you go. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a common <laughs> Mondegreen where I I also I don't know when I realized it was eggs or discovered it was eggs. It, it wasn't that long ago, but yeah, it's a <laughs> it's a common thing, and and it's weird how it it works both ways. Yeah, uh, yeah, perfectly. And I remember, um, in terms of my love of this song, I think it might have reached uh, its peak, or you know, I, I realized the the power of this song, the main version of it, when I was listening to Triple J just had this show, I don't know if they still got it, called the Oz Music Show. It was on every Thursday night. It was hosted by Richard Kingsmill. And one night they had, uh, I think, a, either a best Australian songs of all time or a best Australian songs of the 90s kind of show. And it was uh, 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. And I listened all the way uh, on my little sort of transistor radio 
as soft as soft can be so not, I wouldn't wake up anyone in the house. Um, and Berlin Chair was number one, and I was just so excited. Uh, <laughs> and I realised that little version, it was so soft in my ear, but it kind of like, it, it kind of uh, entered my brain, uh, th- even even at that volume. And um, I remember being so excited and, and that and that morning, the next morning I went to school and I was super tired. I barely slept that night because I was so excited. And I was telling my friends and because our generation were kind of a few years beyond um, UMI's, I guess, popular peak, no one gave a shit. <laughs> no one gave a shit. <laughs> uh, and I was like really upset. And that, that was kind of like a common trend for the next kind of like, um, you know, 10 years where I'm trying to get people into UMI. But you know, that was just basically no thanks, but no thanks. Or, you know, a token effort here, you know, I'll come to a show there. But, um, yeah, that was the first time where I, where I realized that I couldn't quite um, get other people on board. Yeah, that, that was another kind of anecdote that I discovered that it was Double J reviewer Dan Condon named the song the best Australian song in the 90s. Um, right. But, yeah, and I think um, I the, this is – going to be something interesting that'll come up i'm not really a lyrics guy i've always mm-hmm. loved music and mm-hmm. um i guess i'm probably more of a melody tone yeah uh, cat and so uh I, but, but i like the lyrics that will will stand out and punch you in the face mm-hmm. the ones that you'll actually remember and mm-hmm. so you mentioned that i'll give all my eggs to you one but I feel like I'm the rerun that you'll always force yourself to sit through is one of the yeah. best lyrics of all time. Like that's <laughs> undeniable. And yeah. Um, yeah, maybe it's kind of a generational thing, kind of the era that you grow up in. But I think that yeah. that is kind of um, undeniable. But re-listening to this tune for this podcast, a few things jumped out. Firstly, the Lee Ronaldo production, the end. I didn't realize how much the end, the kind of dun 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 dun, dun, dun how much right. that sounds like Sonic Youth. The right. the the great kind of like um yeah the the boppiness or the kind of like the yeah. vibrancy of the guitar is mm. great. And um yeah another thing was just in terms of the general tone and kind of um it's a power pop song, but there's an air of melancholy that runs through it. Mm. And my kind of just general takeaway without overthinking it, listening to it when I'm drunk or fucked up or, you know, on the radio mm. when I'm stone cold, it was always just like the general takeaway was like, Oh, this guy's singing about a relationship where we're fucked, where mm. it was kind of like, we don't have much going on, but like really going through the lyrics, it's more a case of like, I'm fucked. Yeah. Like, yeah, and and that was something that where I was like, oh, that's it's um, it, it it took on an extra level of sadness for me, and and actually made me think about kind of the, if you think that a songwriter needs to kind of tap into any of the original emotion that they were feeling when they wrote the tune, mm-hmm. um, and then if the, if one of those where it's kind of like a sad one becomes yeah. a big hit, and then people like bailing chair people from Perth. <laughs> <laughs> he gave he gives shit for people from Perth in uh in detours um yeah. playing playing um Berlin chair um <laughs> if that's the one so you kind of have to revisit this kind of like um shaky uh, a relationship being on shaky grounds because of your own ineptitude mm. uh for the rest of your life uh, it was kind of like it was uh, yeah. dark uh, but yeah. um yeah just a just a perfect power pop yeah. song and um heartbreaking and uplifting at the same time with some gems of takeaway lyrics that that yeah you can listen to again and again and again yeah yeah and i would say like on the the melancholy of the song that really comes through in the the acoustic version so if anyone hasn't heard that try get that sort of bonus disc from the the number four record um and on lyrics some some lyrics are, are pretty plain but just work like in a song and i think there's a couple in this song that are just perfect like the if you wait just those three words the way that kind of i don't know that kind of meshes with the with the the change in chords at that point is just perfection and then of course at the end you know you know tim's questioning are you too late too late and the and the big scream too late into the sort of um urgent you know sound as ever uh, sorry sonic, sonic UC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah 
ending is just like rock and roll perfection. I don't, I don't know how it gets better than that, but just um, so yeah, sometimes some plain lyrics just work so beautifully um, when the you know when the the music's right. It's just a it's just such a wonderful song. All right, the first biggie in the bag. We did it, mm. Bill and Cher. Oh. Um, yeah. It was we we did it. All right, so track three, Train Spotting. Um, so I'll I'll kick this one off, and sure. I'm not sure if you're aware about uh, you're aware of this, Jono, but I occasionally like to play a game called How Can I Ruin Music from a Band I Like <laughs> oh, by no. comparing it to an overplayed radio hit. Oh yeah. Uh, and in this particular installment, I'd like to say that the intro to Train Spotting. Mm. Reminds me a little of Footloose by oh, Kenny right. Loggins. <laughs> Can you I guess hear? You're it? right. Yeah, yeah. It's it's oh, maybe only five seconds. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. You have once, ruined once it. Once you once you hear. <laughs> 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 Sorry, mate. Sorry. No, no. I'll, I'll 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 make sure that it's only one track. Uh, I'll play this game one track for each <laughs> no. record, but um. Yeah, no, that that's something that kind of jumped out at me where, again, listened to this tune in the past and hadn't focused on it. But, but yeah, yeah, the kind of the detailed listen, uh, I, I would never consider myself a music reviewer by any way, shape or form. Mm. But I definitely do like the the Wikipedia uh, kind of network of trying to mm -hmm. attach like, oh, what does this sound like? Or like, what mm -hmm. is this mm -hmm. reference by? And, and I'm definitely getting a little bit of logins, which... Um, you know, I don't, nothing I don't wrong with that, really. Nothing wrong with that. He's, no, a, he's, a, so. he's a hero. And yeah. um, so anyway, uh, now that I've got that out of the way, how are you feeling about this track? Yeah, look, uh, it's a good track. I don't have much to say about it, I guess. It's it's a, a track, I guess, through my listening of Sound As Ever that I'd listen to um, most of the time rather than all the time. So I'm thinking of a couple of versions that I like of this song. So there used to be this TV show on ABC TV on a late Thursday night called Studio 22, um, where you and I appeared uh, on that particular show during, I think, their Dress Me Slowly promo tour. And they played a great kind of um, acoustic-y version with a, a guest fiddler on, uh, you know, violin guy um, on that. So that was a really good version that wor that's worth checking out. On the... UMI reissue the the super unreal edition that came out in 2013 when they when they brought out you know they re reissued three albums Sound as Ever Hi-Fi Away and Alley Daily um, on the bonus disc of that there's a, a great kind of acoustic -y track that was previously unreleased the uh, acoustic version of Train Spotting as well so yeah good song good solid uh, tune and it kind of continues the the kind of energy of the album so it's a good um it's a good sort of accompaniment to the first couple of songs for me it kind of it sounds like the uh we're all in our 20s and we're all changing at once type of vibe yeah. With, yeah. with a bunch of friends and uh which i can definitely I'm, I'm not in that phase of my life now but i can definitely recall what that was like it was kind of like it it could be the outro song for that the Secret Life of Us show. <laughs> yeah, remember, that's right. <laughs> yeah, the that? reference to splitting the bill and and stuff like that is very. It takes you back to like you you've got a bill of like twenty three dollars and there's eight of you and you you got to like split the bill and all that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, so. yeah, totally. <laughs> and um, yeah, and the, and the kind of the uh talking about exile on Main Street and yeah. there's a, there's a record uh there's a lyric rather where he, he says with a chord call or any Leon tape you'd push. And I'm mm, guessing yeah. that's Leon Russell. Could be, yeah. Never never sort of dug into that. Well, Leon yeah, Russell? Just, yeah, because he collaborated with the Stones and kind of like yeah, TV right. being a massive Stones guy. Yeah, so I was like, of my assumption would be Leon, Leon, the Leon tape that someone's pushing is... Uh, uh, right. and, and the other kind of interesting thing that, that occurred to me, it was like, happy accident that this song gets released at this the same year the book train spotting gets released all oh, right did not know that yeah well and and uh you know train spotting that is is to do with heroin use mm, the mm. the tracks on your arm and it mm. doesn't seem like there's any i guess what what is kind of the the, re the why is this song called train spotting have you ever 
analyze that? Is it a case of like just watching your your life change before you, or is that the kind of concept? Yeah, that's a good question. I've never really thought about it. It's interesting to think of. Yeah, because I mean, the etymology of train spotting. What what is that? I know people refer to train spotters as kind of uh, people who kind of look at ran like like the randomness in various things, like in r- mm. rugby league. It was just like my other sort of passion at the moment. Um, oh, cheeky they, plug, mate! I see cheeky, how you slip. No, that. <laughs> <laughs> no um, they they reference train spotters as people who like love the the kind of random elements of rugby league history, like you know when Melbourne played Adelaide in Hobart in a preseason, you know, like some kind of randomness. That that's how that's referred to. And okay. I, but I know obviously train spotting. Um, the the movie became big and it was kind of um, kind of related to drugs, but I don't actually know. What, why it's called train spotting, or or actually what train spotting means? I've never looked at it, the the definition. Yeah, I've and, no and just, should look at it just right that, now. Just as a random anecdote, um, Noel Gallagher, songwriter from Oasis, mm. and and later kind of touring buddies with UMI, he got approached for Oasis music to be um, in the movie Train Spotting, and right. he turned it down because he's like. I don't want my fucking music in a, a movie about fucking trains. <laughs> <laughs> so so I good. feel like, yeah, the, the reference went over his head at the time as well. So, um, yeah. Well, but, th- yeah. Th- there is just a, a definition I've just quickly looked up. Train spotting is the practice of watching trains, particularly as a hobby, with the aim of noting di- distinctive characteristics. So I think yeah, that, kind of, that's, yeah, that was my understanding as well. Yeah, it was kind of like akin to bird watching a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, but um, anyway, yeah, no. good on you, Timmy. You've you've got us thinking. You've got us googling <laughs> in twenty twenty two. You fucking genius. <laughs> All right. So track four, Adam's ribs. Um, mm. Jono, take us away. Well, this this song actually reminds me of you, Tommy. Um, I remember this moment. I was going to tell yes. the anecdote as well. The <laughs> the Montreal house party. Exactly. So. Tom and Tom's lovely partner t- took me in when they were living in New York and you guys uh, looked after me for a, a good week or so, at least a week. Gee, I think I overstayed my, my welcome there. And, and you, you took me on a Greyhound bus trip from New York <laughs> to Montreal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's that's an experience in itself. But we got yeah. to Montreal, a beautiful city, and it was a beautiful well, – it must have been, I guess, fall, I guess, was it? Yeah, I it was like it was, just, it was perhaps this time of year, maybe. It was yeah, like the summer. Yeah. So like the trees, I remember the trees, um, you know, t- turning their shades of leaves. It was just golden. Um, and we went to this house party with a few people you knew, and I didn't know anyone, uh, but you knew people that I was, feel, you know, as I do, I just feel super awkward in any situation. But you were make, trying to make me feel comfortable, and you, um, you took over kind of DJing duties, or you took over the the laptop that was playing the tunes and he said, no, nah, I want to play this song, this Aussie song. My mate here, my mate here from Sydney, we're going to play this song. What should we play? And I'm like, oh, and then you, you said, what, you and my song should we play? And that obviously like, I was like, oh God, which, which one? And I was <laughs> overthinking it. <laughs> and you know, you know what, Adam's ribs, I'm going to play Adam's ribs. And I'm like, I'm not sure this is the right one. Is that the right one? I want to get people. But you put ah, it on. Shut up, Jono, I'm going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and you put it on and it was, you know, it sounded great to me. I don't think it won anyone over you know, at that p- particular party. Uh, but, you know, it was a great, uh, it was a great moment and it's a good tune. And, um, yeah, no, I, I, but I think that's, I was going to tell this exact same anecdote in that <laughs> I've maybe because I've heard the varied stories of you putting your foot in it and <laughs> maybe, uh, you know, trying to kind of push the UMI drug onto mm. people who weren't ready for it. Yeah. There are, certain tunes in certain situations which work and i feel like where it's going to be like you know i can't really relate to people with music uh and even yeah. people who are my age i feel like everyone's become pretty much siloed off unless you're yeah. a fan of kind of generic spotify playlist mm-hmm. pop stuff you you're kind of going to be segregated and the mm-hmm. algorithm rewards your own kind of peculiarities and addictions mm-hmm. so you can't really expect people to get what you like. So really, when you say people, you're like, I'm not sure if people were digging it. 
but yeah. no one was like, turn this shit off. That's true. That's <laughs> so, a win. So, so, and and it, it kind of fit. That was a from memory a jangly end of the weekend. I've had 120 beers over 72 <laughs> hours, uh, and I pretty pretty much every one of that party was in a similar vibe. And at yeah. the time, it it worked, and I think it kind of did. Um, I only I didn't over play my hand it was just the one tune mm. that i dropped in that particular but but i think it worked in that particular situation made jono happy and yeah. um but yeah i think happy. um yeah it's it's definitely i think very much the standout obvious choice for go back to 1993 mm. this is going to be the, the first single off the yeah. record do, do you agree yeah, I, I can definitely see that. I think, like, in hindsight, the band have often spoken about, you know, I can't believe we didn't kick off with Berlin Chair as the first single, but, yeah, when you think about the, the context of the time, it makes a lot of sense. And, and the way it kind of, like, um, it rolls throughout yeah. the, those three minutes of the song and then just uh, tunes up towards the end, um, it's pretty exciting. And I, it would have been a, a cracking live track. And there are a couple of really cracking live versions on the, the various bonus discs. Well, yeah, and and I think that to kind of round things off, I'd always just interpreted this song as kind of like the epitome of kind of like a '90s song, and and I think mm. honestly that's to do with the music video where Tim and the band are looking extremely '90s. Um, <laughs> yeah, everything yeah. about it is like the, the epitome, right, yeah. of, and and it's a uh, cool video from memory. I think it's when they're on tour in the states in mm, Vegas yep. or somewhere, but um. The and so that kind of like clouded my judgment, but I listened to it again and it honestly reminds me so much of the Who, like the early Who. Right. Um, the like the there's this cool clip of the Who playing I Can't Explain, which I believe was their first single, and right. it's like early, early days of the Who where like Roger Daltrey's wearing like sunglasses on stage, and that's when all their kind of mod fans were just like hopped up on amphetamines and there's a really cool mm-hmm, kind mm-hmm. of like music video and kind of that energy of the track i feel like is replicated somewhat in the kind of ongoing repetitive beat and and um that's something that this band i like called the ocs um mm-hmm. it's kind of like a, a, a one-man project john dwyer he talks mm-hmm. about like where every couple tracks on his records he asks i think i believe he has drummers he has uh, not just one drummer plural he says this one needs a bonehead beat where it's just like boom chat boom boom chat (laughs) and and so this is the epitome of kind of like we want the bonehead beat we want the kind of like um ongoing uh repetitive three chord riff but Mm -hmm. it's perfect and there's kind of like freedom within that and Mm. uh yeah, so it, it reminded me of the Who, but through very much a '90s filter, and yeah. uh, I think that's why I like it so much. Um, but yeah, yeah, and oh, well, incidentally as well, um, on the Berlin Chair single, "Can't Explain," uh, is a B side on that single. There you go. There you go. Uh, yeah, and and just to round, sorry, to round things off properly, I always think of Daniel Johns because this song is obviously about anorexia. And I'm not sure if you're aware, he just dropped a very recent video a couple of days ago where it was like a self-produced thing on YouTube. Where he's I read a headline. About, sorry? I read a headline, yeah. Yeah, he, he basically just opened up about why he got arrested for drink driving. It was like nine months ago. And um, right. yeah, just took about all the shit. It was pretty raw, but it was one of those kind of like, self-produced things where okay. he's like it's time to open up and it's like <laughs> i smell a new record <laughs> <laughs> yeah because there's been like a daniel john's podcast recently the, the life of yeah daniel mini john's. documentary series yeah 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 okay. so yeah there, there's something cooking commercially but anyway it just made me think about silver chair of the course, name yeah. taken from sliver the nirvana song and berlin chair mm-hmm. and i was like oh i wonder Daniel Johns, teenage Daniel Johns, throes of his anorexia, mm. listening to this particular song, like this would have been his fucking anthem. Like this, this song is all about, yeah. you know, just if if you don't, if we don't eat, everything will be fine. <laughs> yeah, it, that's it, right. It's it's just a very like when you know for a fact someone was a huge fan of a record and then thinking they must have listened to this, 
at a particular stage in their life, this must have been a very impactful song for Mr. John. So, yeah, that's true. That's true. I wonder if that'll come out in the uh, subsequent uh, uh, soft focus videos before the new album. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, we can only Definitely. hope. All right, track five, Rosedale, John O. Rosedale. Immediate thoughts? Yeah, well, one of my favourite songs, actually, of, of the album. I just love the kind of uh, descending riff that kind of kicks off the song. I didn't actually realise that – this is embarrassing as a New South Wales person – but I didn't realise Rosedale was a place uh, in in New South Wales and only realised it was a place. I just thought it was kind of a random word or maybe the name of a pub or something um, – but there's a reference to Rosedale in The Waterboy, which is uh, the single off your my latest album, The Lives of Others. Um, and I'm like, oh, hang on. Rosedale might be a place. I looked it up. It's on the south coast um, of New South Wales around kind of Ulladulla and all that sort of stuff. So anyway, but back to the song. It's it's a beautiful song. It's, uh, I don't really know what it's about, but it kind of sounds like, um, you know, 20-somethings just about to – about to sort of take on the world basically yeah and and you know at the end of the the song it's kind of see around the world which is uh, kind of a beautiful way to finish the song uh one of the the features of the song which i love which i'd love to see more in rock and roll is like uh dialogue in song so in this particular song there's you know dialogue where you know i think it might be rusty comes in and says is, is it cool if i grab a little grab of your, a time, little of your the, time that was my yeah, question a, i was like is that uh is that Rusty or Mark? And but yeah, did it, no, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Is yeah, it Andy? Is it Andy or, uh, or Mark. Mark? Yeah. No idea. Good. Good point. It, it wasn't Rusty. Because Mark. Because Mark sings the second last track, That's right? That's right. Off the field. Yeah. So yeah. I'm gonna. Say, I've got no idea. I'm gonna say for argument's sake, Mark. Because it, yeah, I've got no idea why. But yeah, dialogue in songs. I think this is a, a, it's a beautiful kind of exchange. Um, and then, like at the end, kind of Tim screaming back, and it's it's fantastic. I'd love to hear more of it. Well, what do you think of Rosedale? Uh, you, yeah, you all the points you essentially just kind of took out of my mouth. Um, yeah. yeah, see around the world, and and yeah, I feel like I don't know that this is one where, as I referenced before, kind of the concept of like the party record, like you'd have a on at a party, because yeah. for some reason I think that the next you and my albums, they, I don't know if this is just kind of my own perspective mm. clouding things, but I feel like they're more personal and deep and they've okay. got the big, they've got the big hit singles mm. uh, and then maybe kind of like the, um, yeah, the party kind of dancey tracks. But there's something about this one where it feels kind of like built for the kind of like, yeah, we're having a few people around on a Friday night or a Saturday night. Yeah. You can have, a, you can have it, on in the background without anyone's buzz getting killed and yep. it kind of elevating the mood. And I feel like this is the the epitome of of that type of vibe. Whereas the other records, I feel like it they're the songs are almost too good or too personal where people right. can kind of like get tangent off into their own kind of um space. Yeah. So for me this one it it just reminded me kind of the era and uh, yep. I was curious about rosedale as well but you answered that question for me so i could up. see i could see that this album would be a good party album like you say i think it would it'd go well and then there's the odd sort of moment or plenty of moments in the in the album where people go oh this is good what's this or oh i like this bit that kind of thing on on whether it's the umi party album i've thought about this um as someone who's never thrown a party, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> someone who's never really thrown a party but thought about it you know maybe one day i will which uh umi album would i put on i'm naturally inclined uh, before talking to you now to go hi-fi way or number four record or, or even convicts you know that those kind of that they're kind of like um direct um i i, I do understand where you come from there's there's personal moments as well but mm -hmm. hi-fi way for me is that kind of like um, punchy and, yeah, and sparky yeah. kind of album that I, I probably would revert to first but yeah maybe maybe you're right maybe this is the way to go sound as ever that's why All you right. throw the best parties mate you see <laughs> differently to the rest of us yeah that's that's gonna be me alright it's time for Adam's <laughs> ribs once again in the fucking <laughs> retirement village one day repeat <laughs> yeah alright next track um, forever and easy so again this is for yeah. me where the aerosmith kind of right, vibe okay. with the guitar yep. i was mm. like 
again, this is another uh, one where I wouldn't have known this if I hadn't read Detours, but he's buddy, Timmy's buddies with the guy from the Black Crows. I think there's a small and there's a small detour within that book where he's just finished a show in LA and there's no one there and then the lead singer from the Black Crows comes in and he's like they they can kind of share some solidarity about some rock star stuff and he took some solace from that. Um, But anyway, it just kind of reminded me of American kind of bluesy rock Aerosmith uh, Black Crows, but then also Mm. kind of like. I, I sensed kind of like um some Madchester Stone Roses kind of fool's gold type of that okay. that riff as well maybe some John Squire riffage as well which yeah. again it had just been something for me where I'd listened to this record in the past I hadn't I hadn't processed kind of what what are the influences here and all that but mm. I definitely felt like I could see myself. As a 17-year-old, when this came out, this would kind of be like me and my yeah. buddies, our dazed and confused, cruising in the in the Holden Commodore. <laughs> I could uh, let's let's turn this up. There's some cheeky babes <laughs> up ahead. Let's 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 turn on forever and easy. So oh, anyway, yeah. I kind of I kind of like the the whole kind of vibe of this, and mm. uh, yeah, it made me nostalgic uh, nostalgic for the era once again. Yeah, and. This is like the ultimate in riffage. This is the kind of track, you know, the, the first riff, the kind of, I guess, chorus riff, whatever you call it. Um, for me, this might have been the song at the top of the show. I talked about the anecdote where I got caught by my my father um, rocking out. <laughs> this might have been the song that I was caught out. I know it was during the uh, Dress Me Slowly era, but it might have been this song because it's that kind of song that makes you want to play incredible rock guitar. And it's also got great screams in it and 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 like great sort of uh, harmonies at the end about, you know, taking it easy or whatever the, the word is at the end. Uh, I always, because I came into UMI in 98 and only saw them live, I think, from 2000, I ne- I don't think I ever saw it live and I always wanted to see it live, but I, I did see it live once, I think, from memory, at a Sunday afternoon gig at the Annandale Hotel. Um, it might have been, I don't know, 2000 and six seven or something i can't quite remember but it was a saturday afternoon it was like 40 degrees in sydney i don't know why they played a saturday afternoon gig but they did but i love the idea of saturday after sunday sorry sunday afternoon sunday afternoon rock it was uh, it worked beautifully it was boiling and they played i think they just come from shark park in cronulla they played like a festival uh there they played a set there and then came to the end to, to play a sunday afternoon set um, and they, yeah, it was a bit looser than usual. And they played a few different songs, including, I think, Forever and Easy. And I was like, yes, finally. And it was it was a really good rendition too. There was that era, I think maybe like 10 years ago, where Rogers was going around saying, do I need to replace myself as the singer of You Are Mine, just be yeah. the guitarist? And mm-hmm. that was something where I was always just like, what are you talking about, man? Like <laughs> singer songwriter, you know, best song of the nineties and all that, like just acclaimed, mm. um, you know, you can, you can sing and you can write songs and that's what you should continue doing. But you can't. And, and I guess again, reading the book and kind of like learning about his experiences in, mm. was a box, the jazz Jesuit, the, yep, that's the right. other band and just kind of like getting some appreciation for, mm how good a guitarist he was and just kind of how much like of a, um, I think Dave Grohl is the undisputed rock pig in the world. Like if it was just someone <laughs> sure, who just yeah. wants to fucking, um, you know, roll around in, in the, the shit of rock for the rest yeah. of their life. It would be Davey G, but Timmy's up there. He's a man who just, he loves, um, riffage and, and he's an artist as well. We, we can't forget that, mm. but, it's it's tracks like this that make me kind of and also kind of the whole himself doubting his ability to sing well and and mm. give his uh, do his songs justice and that whole kind of insecurity trip but it's songs like this that make me realize that like oh he he does there's a part of him that would just be happy to be Pete Townsend be the guitar mm. god and and focus and and exist in that realm and kind yep. of the the whole songwriting stuff is just kind of like almost an added bonus in, mm-hmm, in some mm-hmm. respects. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And, and reading Detours as well, it gives you a good 
insight into, I guess, um, the different sides of him. Yeah, there's definitely a side who would love to kind of just be the guitarist in a rock and roll band. I mean, he's just joined his favourite band, kind of the hard on, so that there's an element there, but there's also the side of him that, you know, just wants to have a, a cup of tea and, and kind of read poetry or listen to kind of Greek music or whatever it is. So, but yeah, I think this shows that um, he, if he, you know, he's got the, he's got the chops, he had the chops. He'll always have the chops if he wants to sort of access this this side of it and the the rockery and the riffage. So yeah, great tune. Track seven. Everyone's to blame. Uh, Everyone's to blame. Yeah. That that definitely something that I'm pretty sure I wrote a poem with that title. Maybe uh, right. year nine poetry or something. Nice. That 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 type of feeling where you kind of like yeah let's 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 all accept a responsibility here, folks and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and something else that jumped out at me was um i believe there is a rhyme that he pretty much re- he says if i could rip at your shirt just to see mm. it, if it'll hurt i believe old mate timmy recycles this rhyme years later in kick a hole in the sky crawling through right? the dirt to see oh, where it hurts and uh I, I recall that because like it was um kick a hole in the sky was on our me and my buddy uh alex's kind of when we'd play fifa with each other that was like the the standard oh, right. we'd always we'd always chime in with each other no matter how um <laughs> uh you know the aggressive we were being with each other on the on the virtual pitch we'd always yeah. harmonize w- with uh one another for that particular lyric and i was like oh he's kind of like it's a similar type of thing but i you know it's kind of like the if if you're in if you're influenced by country and western mm. music rip it rip it your shirt just to see if it'll hurt come oh, on that's, beautiful. that's that's something that you'll you'll need to use many times in your career but uh what are your thoughts on this on this particular tune yeah, it, look, it's one of the favourite songs, one of my favourite songs on the album. I think it's an unsung hero of the album. That's how I describe it. And there's, I think everything about the song is kind of underrated in a way. Like I've never heard anyone kind of say everyone's to blame is one of your mice best. And may, maybe it's not, but I just think it's a high quality, high quality track. Um, and interesting where you say, everyone's to blame like it, it's kind of like let's all share the blame i've always taken it as everyone but me is to blame i've always thought <laughs> the character in this song is like kind of blaming everyone else and everyone's yeah, to yeah. blame uh except me but i don't actually know if if the song's about much at all but i just love how it, after like the sort of intense and sort of rolling start to the album we get to this point and and the the vocal is is a bit more measured and it's quite m- melodic um, and it's it's really a bit more of a slow burn of a song, and I think it's actually a perfect way to kind of to progress the album from from that really intense and, and kind of uh, full on first six tracks, and it, even like the the last kind of minute of the song where where it, you know gets that kind of lead guitar. I love that how that kind of plays out. I reckon it's one of my favourite sort of guitar bits. Um, it's it's nothing, um, you know out there but it's i think it's absolutely perfect for for the tune i don't think don't think i've seen it live either unfortunately oh interesting that's that's why that's <laughs> they're just not playing it so you keep coming to shows exactly like, yeah <laughs> maybe maybe this time um yeah well let's address kind of the um timmy's vocals or or his singing sure. and it, because he references in detours that he started singing because essentially the other guys like couldn't sing whatsoever. So he'd never mm-hmm. really had confidence. And there's that anecdote in the book where he kind of, uh, you know, having a few drinks or maybe sharing a jazz cigarette with his uni buddies. And then he mm. rips out pinball wizard on the acoustic guitar and, you know, really good guitarist. Everyone's impressed. And one of his mates like, come on, Timo, that was fucking all right, but you can't sing for shit, mate. Oh, and, um, <laughs> Yeah, so like cut him deep or like made him extra insecure. But a, a couple of things, he can sing. The 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 the, the the it's different where someone's kind of like out of tune and it's mm. um it's abrasive on your ears. So like he's in tune, and also you can uh, if you have a really good singer, 
mm. it's going to screw up the longevity of your band. Like, because they're, they're inevitably going to lose their voice. Whereas <laughs> if someone is always has a kind of like unique or kind of um, non-standard singing voice, mm. that is always going to be okay. Cause that's the yeah. expectation. And, and I feel like, yeah, I like his voice. I think it suits his songs. I think mm. he uses it well. There's there's parts on this album where he, he really like pushes it out where mm. he clearly wouldn't do that anymore. Um just mm. in terms of it's not going to he's not going to be able to hit those notes consistently or whatever, but I think that um in terms of like the singers that he clear like Paul Weller would be another one for me from the okay. jam. I'm like mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not the best singer in the world, but for what he's going for, it works. And so I'd put yeah. Rogers in that category. And I think that you're not thinking about this, or I assume musicians aren't thinking about this when they first start writing, recording records, but mm. it is going to help you in the long run because you can only get uh, more character and more kind of uh, the graveliness or, mm. or whatever happens to your voice. You can kind of play with it and, and fuck around with it as opposed to freddie mercury's of the world where it's like pristine perfect mm. voice the, the only way is down from there so i think it's actually a real um asset. it's a real strength it's an asset mm. of the band for sure yeah yeah i agree i mean it's uh it's a you know it straight away when when you hear tim it's tim's voice so that that's i think that's a huge strength yeah it's maybe not the strongest voice ever but it's also it's produced some of the great vocal moments in australian history like he can reach those moments and and in these early albums and even now when he's kind of screaming rock and roll screaming is not easy to do that's a real skill i can't yeah. do it as i mentioned before like i can only do it in a whisper like i can only mime it um it, it's a real skill so like uh, yeah i guess um it's it doesn't have the robustness of of some vocalists but um it's his it's his voice and i think he he can he's got a beautiful kind of turn of melody and and uh I, when i started listening to umi and i was trying to explain to friends at school why, why i like them and i didn't i don't have the musical kind of lexicon i'd say they're just they're just really good at verses and i think what that meant in my mind was i loved the way um he would uh use melody in the verses for whatever reason like the way he would use his voice as an accompaniment or a, a juxtaposition to the guitars, uh, just for a simple melodic line. I think he's got an incredible skill um, on that level. And yeah, like I say, there's some of the great vocal moments of Australian music history that's come from his mouth. So when people say he can't sing, I just, you know, scoff basically and uh, put my hand up and walk away. Amen to that. All right, <laughs> track eight. Jamie's got a gal. Um, mm. bold, bold move writing, um, <laughs> songs about your family members It is, it is. And, and, and it's something where, you know, because this was a track that was on, uh, the cream and the croc inside. So I've been listening to this song for the last 20 years mm. and yeah, I became aware over the years that it was about a, uh, his brother leaving mm. the band essentially. Mm. And, um, kind of like. When you're young, you don't really understand the kind of gravity of that, perhaps. Mm. Um, not necessarily someone like moving on, deciding to leave a band, but like uh, writing about it and publicly kind of uh, putting your feel like. So I'm just curious, what was the kind of next family dinner like? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, yeah, there's that line, game's a game. Sure ain't my place to say, but you sure ain't like you were yesterday. That is so brutal. I know. It's, it's kind of like, is the new missus a bitch? That's that's what I, where I'm if I'm picking up what he's putting down here like but but, but it, and it's it's couched obviously because he's kind of like um, the things I promised not to do with you today I sure mm. need to tonight so someone yeah. feels like a bender and and Bruvs was usually there um, yeah. to to help out and um, yeah no so it, it's you know and and it also just must be weird to be a part of a bet you know like families kind of forever whether you like it or not so mm. uh, it would be just very interesting to know like what it was like for these guys to the first time jamie heard this song and then like what's both <laughs> tim and jamie's relationship with this song now like fuck 
they, those were crazy days. I can't believe I wrote a song about you just opting out of a band. But anyway, what, yeah, what are your no. thoughts? Yeah, I, I thought the same thing, and I think that that's that's natural, I guess. It's like when – have you ever – has anyone ever said to you, you've changed, mate? That it just hurts so much. <laughs> like, what? No, I haven't changed. You've changed. Yeah. Well, that's just, yeah. So, I don't know the um, specifics of their relationship, probably like typical big bro, little bro stuff, but yeah, in general – when you're related to a storyteller or a songwriter or something and you're consuming something like that, you know, is there any sense of like appreciating the art of it or would you just like be going, what, what, what was that? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> is that about hanging, hanging on every word. I'm going to get my attorney on the line, mate. No, yeah, yeah, no, it's, and, and I, I something, uh, yeah, again, just putting myself in, in, maybe Jamie doesn't give a shit and uh, it's not like yeah, it goes not. in on anything, uh, that that deep here but it's just the explicit he could have called it like uh jerome's got a gal or something he could have, he could <laughs> yeah, have changed right. the name perhaps um yeah but yeah, yeah just the way that he counts it in at the beginning he's just like completely um mm. you know normal uh you know even even tone but then it goes into kind of like a uh a pretty deep and uh mm. yeah an admission of sorts, yeah. but uh, well, well, I mean, how does the song start? Goes, James got a girl. Don't think things gonna be the same. Uh, well, don't he think ain't gonna, he ain't coming. He uh, ain't coming out drinking tonight. Think he's gonna yeah. change his name. Oh, it's just uh, it's yeah. Something. But what I would say is that there is a companion piece to this song, I believe, in Tim's solo record. I think his fourth solo record, "The Luxury of Hysteria." The closing track of that is called James the Second, and it's um, a beautiful. It's one of my favourite all time Tim songs. It's uh, and I'm going to say that I feel like I'm going to say that so many times over this the course of this series, <laughs> <laughs> but it really is. Lots of jewels, mate. Not many bullets. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and this song is is so beautiful. It's kind of like a mea culpa in a way, sort of saying we've been through a lot, but you know, I still love you, bro. And like the the chorus is like somewhere you know this damn thing's still just yours and mine, yours and mine. So in my mind, you know, it's about his brother, I know that, but um, it, in my mind it's a nice way of tying this bow where it's kind of like, yes, um, we've had our issues, I guess. I don't know. They, they might be really close, but no idea. But from a, a musical sense, from an art sense of what he's put out, there's this song going, hey, you've left the band, you've left me in the lurch. I feel shit now because of it. But now th- this song um, sort of ties that bow and says – I still love you. This thing that I've built, it's actually ours. Um, it always has been, always will be. Um, so for anyone who hasn't heard that song, I, I you know, encourage you to listen to it because it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And it's, it really is a, a cracking song just in and of itself. But there's also that, that level of uh, you know, brotherhood as well. That's why he's a super fan, folks. Not the super fan, but he's he's looking into the future. He's looking into solo records. He's tying loops that you didn't even know were there. That's why he's here. Fucking yeah, John. Yeah, that's right. John is bringing the heat. Um, all right, track nine. Who's leaving you now? Mm, now, I guess, look, if you're being – I think what people would say about this album is it, maybe this is the point it starts losing a bit of steam. Uh, which m- maybe sounds harsh. I haven't listened to Who's Leaving You Now too much over the years. I think it's it's a rare Andy Kent songwriting credit. Nothing else comes to mind that, that he's on. I'm happy to be corrected on that. But listening to it over the last couple of weeks, preparing for this, um, appreciate it a bit more. And I think it's actually a pretty good hangover song. Uh, I went out for a few beers the other night and was listening, it to, listening to it, uh, feeling sorry for myself the next morning. And... It just it hit me it hit me like right in the the sweet spot. So yeah, decent tune, a bit of an album track, nothing wrong with it at all. What what do you think? I for me just the takeaway was the sounds like Radiohead, which I'd never oh, thought right. about before. Early Radiohead, um, the, yeah. the yeah the early nineties Radiohead, yeah, similar era where mm. I was like, oh yeah, this and I'll and Radiohead you. would probably uh do you know the obviously very different kind of operatic vocals on top and then uh crescendo with kind of um guitars would be mm. uh a, a bit different but yeah i just thought it was kind of like yeah it sounded 
I, I like the way that it's kind of um sparse and mm-hmm. position you know things are kind of in the right place and yeah i i would say yeah definitely a, a cool calm down song mm. for me yeah. uh and yeah it definitely does signal kind of like um the end is coming up but mm. but i think that it ends in an interesting way this this album and mm. which we'll which we'll kind of get to now but um Ordinary track ten. This is another one that I believe was on the best, the Cream and the Croc. So I've been listening to this oh, one yeah. for years. But um, yeah, what what are your what are your thoughts? Yeah, this was one of the songs that I came to first that that hit me first in my listening of sound as ever. Like I said before, this was the the fourth album that I came to of you and I. And I guess you know I was in that kind of. Um, you know, sensitive part of my life where acoustic songs were, were hitting me. And so, yeah, um, yeah Ordinary uh, definitely hit me. I think it's a, a great tune. Actually, this kind of brings up some embarrassing stuff as well. I used to, yeah, after sort of getting into UMI and stuff, I picked up a guitar and sort of taught myself how to play guitar with a, my brother's guitar and, and, and a chord book. And this was one of the first songs that I was able to play because um, I used to go on, there used to be, there's a website, umi.com.au, which is different to the one now. And it was kind of like a fan site. I think Davey Lane actually helped run you it. You learned everything, right? That's how they, they yeah. found it. Is that the, that's that's right, the yeah. folklore I've always understood, but but that was yeah. the, the truth true, of the matter? Yeah, because yeah. yeah, you used to go on and, and, and go to the tabs section of the website and it would have like all these songs transcribed. And um, yeah, Davey Lane would be one of the names. I think the other guy was Danny Yayu, Yayu I think. And yeah, so... Davy probably transcribed ordinary for me. Thank you. And it was one of the few because like I I don't know anything about music. Um, I just had this chord book and this guitar. It it was easy for me to understand because I think it's like D minor, um, G, C, B minor, A minor. So I knew the shapes of that. Whereas the other you know a lot of other other chords I just didn't understand and I didn't know how to do bar chords or anything like that. So anyway, I I kind of learned how to do a really bad version of it and during like end of high school, early uni, I would, um, you know, there'd inevitably be a guitar around and I'd sort of grab it and, um, and try to play ordinary. And like, I wasn't, honestly, wasn't very good. And, uh, it wasn't long before someone took the guitar off me. And then, cause like everyone wants to sing along to songs. And like I said, I was a, a couple of years younger than most the, the UMI sort of generation, I guess. So people at these parties were just not, never heard it, just not interested people want to sing along to, I don't know, Foo Fighters or whatever, you know. Um, so the guitar was always pretty swiftly taken off me, but uh, I'd, I'd always try. Yeah, no, I, I feel like for me this track is kind of perhaps the most kind of direct precursor of um, the more intros, introspective acoustic mm-hmm. songs that we'd get on Hi-Fi Way um or hourly daily kind of the the tim solo part of the the mm. repertoire if you will mm-hmm. and i feel like yeah it it definitely holds up there is one particular lyric i'm curious whether you can enlighten me mm. what the fuck it means is and mm. everyone who's watching now at the movie that's always rerun can mm. throw a laugh and stick in the pinks what the yeah, fuck right. does stick in the pinks mean I've got no idea. To, can yeah. I be brutally honest with you? I didn't know it was yeah. stick in the pinks. I thought it was stick in the pan. <laughs> like, so <laughs> there you go. Another no eggs idea. and eggs situation. Yeah, um, stick in the pinks. Is that kind of sexual? Like, uh, I'm very naive when it comes <laughs> to this stuff. Like, I, I don't, I don't think he'd throw out a, a stick in the pinks. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I, I didn't. I hope that. Like, I, I'm so naive with this stuff. Like, I, that all, that stuff always goes over my head. So I'm always assuming I'm missing something. But um, yeah. No, 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 and it's it's also like, yeah, I don't I don't know, but uh, yeah, I, I just had no. I was yeah. You know, maybe, maybe the someone. super the super fan. If you're out there, get in touch. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. anyway, what I kind of also like about this, and it, it, again, it's perhaps because I was fortunate enough to have a bunch of my mates uh, into UMI at once and so like mm. maybe in in kind of like when we were like 18 19 like one guy would have a girlfriend and then they'd be so there'd be one of those situations where it'd be like 10 guys and like one or two girls and then the guys with girlfriends would go home and they'd just be like eight dudes like <laughs> let's 
uh, drink some more beer and smoke some more weed and we'd like play some albums and it would be like, I don't know, playing some Mario Kart or whatever. And mm. then uh, you get to like a quiet introspective track and then everyone would just kind of feel lonely and like, why don't I have a girlfriend? <laughs> 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 so that's I anyway, that it, doing, yeah. we, we didn't actually do that with this album. Um, but we did it with yeah. plenty of other albums and it was yeah. always around track eight, nine, <laughs> where they drop one of these, where you'd be like, yeah, even though <sighs> you may have just won on Mario Kart 64 battle, the, the victory wasn't quite that sweet because you, you were maybe thinking <laughs> about your lot, your lot in life a little too deeply. So anyway, oh, uh, yeah, brought back feeling some, all too well. some funny memories. So anyway, that's ordinary track yeah. 11. You scare me. And I just felt like this, this is kind of like the um, it, it just kind of the uh, you and my laying claim to being a part of the Australian kind of like bastion of pub rock. I was like, this right. is just tunnel vision rock and roll, baby. This is like, um, I don't know. It's it, and it's something that I'd never really thought of before. I was like, it doesn't sound that dissimilar from like the screaming jets or something right? where I'd never really, th- I'd always thought that like, even though kind of your mind's a dirty rock and roll band, that I'd always thought they were kind of slightly more highbrow kind of like than the stand, you know, those kind of like mm-hmm. uh, meat and potatoes, Aussie rock mm-hmm. bands. But I was like, Oh, th- this song kind of fits into that mold. Right. Am I off track okay. here? Do you, do, you, do you kind of see what I'm, what I'm getting at? Uh, when when you say it, I, I can I can gather I guess. Um, for me, I it's one of the songs I haven't really got into as much as the other ones. Uh, but obviously the last couple of weeks I have. It's it's a slow burner, so it's an unusual track for you. My probably their could be one of their longest tracks, if not their longest track. And for any long track, you know, there's there's got to be payoff for your effort. You know, return on investment. And I think this one, uh, sorry for the financial lingo, how embarrassing, but like this one does, it does give you that payoff with a, a cracking sort of chorus and, and, and there's keys at the end that sort of becomes like pretty, pretty weird at the end, which I ne- never really noticed and, uh, until like listening to it properly. So I, I'm going to sort of say I'm with you half the way there, but, uh, I, I'm not going to go all the way with you on, on that observation. But, um, in terms of, what we were saying earlier about just simple lyrics that just work in a song sometimes. Just the phrase, you scare me, I think is like a beautiful, beautiful terrain uh, for rock music and uh, is probably untapped generally. And I think it's a, an interesting one and probably relates to the kind of the subject matter perhaps of the first song around um, coprolalia and, and, and sort of meds and stuff like that, maybe. Mm. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure, but it's interesting terrain. Yeah, and, and to be clear i don't i i found it endearing where i could feel like it, there were similarities or connections to other mm-hmm. kind of staples of australian rock where whereas i just assumed that kind of you and mine and roger's stuff was always kind of like maybe because of his voice or his like his mm. the quirks of his songwriting it always kind of like stood off slightly to the side not as an mm. elitist thing but more just kind of like it's very unique and yeah. this, where I was like, oh, I see where they, ca- I can kind of almost like smell the pubs yeah. in the late '80s or something. Like there, it, yeah, there was that's something true. kind of like tactile about it, where I was like, oh, this is is where, th- this is kind of the Aussie pub rock that, that was popular in the '80s, and they were clearly like born out of. Yeah. Um yeah. With 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 obviously Rogers' kind of uh, specific songwriting skills on top of that. Yeah, yeah, I see you. Um, track 12 off the field. Mm. Uh, so it, just with this one, this was one where it was like, you know, when it's kind of, you, you're trying to understand what was the actual, like, was this only in Australia, this track or I think uh, so. I think yeah. it was left off the subsequent, uh, American release. So it was interesting and, and obviously, you know, appropriate that it was part of the reissue that, that came out in 2013 so yeah but for me um because i this was the fourth album i got into of you and i i knew that there were movements um from the drummer in in terms of drummer's seat um at the end of this album and that this song didn't make subsequent additions for me it was like oh it's not it's not really a you and my song so i'm not gonna spend much time in it so i haven't 
only I think I only listened to it all the way through for the first time a couple of weeks ago because I've always kind of like, well, this is not part of the album, so I'm just going to skip from 11 to 13, strange to sound as ever. But um, listening to it over the last couple of weeks, it's, it's not a bad tune. It's a good riff. Um, it sort of goes in, you know, it kind of rocks a bit. But, yeah, I mean, I haven't really spent too much time with it. I felt like um, the, the couple of listens that I've had over the last couple of weeks um, – you know, I was kind of like, "Oh, when does Sound as Ever start?" Uh, but to be fair, it's it's that's only because I haven't really given it a, a, as much a chance as I should have. Yeah, no, I I would tend to agree with all that, and you know, I just I think it's interesting after the kind of um, introspective eight. 19 year old boys playing Mario Kart, why are we all single? Vibes of ordinary. <laughs> then they've yeah. kind of got the 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 tunnel rock of you scare me off the field and sound as ever which kind of like gets you Mm. going again and um so i feel like they've just in terms of the flow of the album it's a kind of um yeah i I just think it it kind of fits well in between you scare me and sound as ever where it was kind of like let's let's end this on kind of like a similar vibe so yeah yeah, and and i just felt like the, the riff itself was kind of like velvet revolver esque uh, yeah, where it was okay. like where, where it was kind of like a very low kind of like a low fi version of what like velvet revolver would do. Yeah. Not that I was a huge fan of them, but I was like, oh it's kind of like similar again, maybe like an Aerosmith type of thing, just a big kind of like cock rock type of sure. tune, which I think if you're a young man, that's that's kind of what you want. Yeah, it's kind of like, okay, we've got a song, we need a riff. And, he, and yeah. what about this? Do, 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 do. It's a good riff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it kind of, yeah. So lucky Tim has a an unlimited grab bag of, of riffery. Hell yeah. All right. Closing track. Uh, the titular, is that how you say that? 13, track 13. Yeah. Sound titular? as ever. Titular. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, is it well, you got me a drink first. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, um, so what are your thoughts? Oh look, it's just a perfect way to end this this album. It's become a, a live staple. I've noticed uh, the last I don't know ten years. It's it's always now kind of like towards the end of the show or in an encore. And actually, there's a, an incredible live version from the someone else's crowd bonus live disc. I think from Seattle. I think that was when they supported Soundgarden. That kind of uh, tour there, which just shows Timmy at his absolute best in, uh, in incredible vocal performance and and riffery at the same time it's just an incredible performance uh but in terms of the album track you know the whole um it, once again it's it's the same theme as uh coprolalia and maybe you scare me around you know i can read your degree now give me my medicine about being prescribed an inappropriate level or amount of um meds i think and you know s- sound i guess saving him and so it's it's good on that level uh, from a musical sense as well. It, uh, it's a great riff and, and a great sort of climax. And, and the, uh, I guess Ronaldo, I don't know if this is a Ronaldo thing, but the mashup at the end with the, the little snippets from the, the various yeah. songs, um, which was a nice touch. Yeah, no, and, and that jumped out at me as well because I feel like there are – as a young man, I was a real Beatles head guy and that was maybe something which – I was like, oh, you and my Tim Rogers is always kind of like more on the Stones side of the mm. fence. And I was mm. like, mm-hmm. and but there are th- those kind of like snippets at the end. It's kind of almost White Album-esque where yeah, uh, all the, the Beatles would like, um, you know, I think it's in, uh, what's it? Um, all You Need Is Love with a, mm-hmm. someone saying, she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in this, there's a similar thing where he's singing the tracks from the other albums. And so yeah. I was like, oh, that's interesting. It's kind of like you you and my song with something kind of Beatles-esque, like the song Tuesday is mm. is one where it's like, oh, that's kind of like day in the life or something. But, but oh, the, yeah. there's not very kind of many Beatles-esque moments, but I'd find the end of this one. And yeah, it's just the... Uh, cracking crescendo and first of all it's a cool tight like it's a great album title sound as ever it's kind of mm. like um 
growing up, my old man used to make uh, said that scousers always used to say sound is a pound lying okay. on the ground waiting to be found. So it's like <laughs> if you were sound, you were cool. Yeah, but oh, right. It's it's kind of got like this. So sound as ever, like I'm fine as ever. Mm. But yeah, w- with this lyric and as you were kind of referencing before, it's kind of like um yeah, just the fact that he's alone with sound and that's mm. his say you know his savior his kind of like Mm. purpose and uh yeah it was it's a great way to close this record yeah and it's yeah it's mentioned in in his book as well isn't it so it's absolutely like still a big part of his life uh and and it's kind of had ongoing impacts of that kind of period so yeah it kind of has a bit more gravity to that just incidentally i think i don't know if i'm imagining this but I think it's coming back to me now that the the title of the album perhaps was going to be called Sounders Never originally, uh-huh. and then they they thought better. So I'm not sure if I'm making that up, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that that was the case, or it has been mentioned somewhere, but it was Sounders Ever in the end. All right, so they're the tracks. Um, what an album, what a record. What, what, a, what a record, what a start. <laughs> what a start. Um, so, yeah, just in terms of, Kind of any final thoughts here in respect to, yeah. Why don't we do that? We'll we'll talk like, do you? Why don't you read the kind of the the rusty mm. note that you mentioned? Yeah. Uh, to me, uh, because Mark Mark Tunnelay, is that how you say it? He was the drummer on this record. Yeah. He left after the record came out, and then Rusty came in, which kind of changed mm. the band dynamics. We'll talk about that in the next step. But yeah, um, yeah read me the, read me Rusty's note about him coming in. Yeah, so this is on the the reissue that came out in 2013, a super super unreal edition of Sound as Ever. And these are the the great things. It's what you don't really get, uh, you know, in the the digital era the sort of tactile booklets and the the stories that come through in this. And so in each of these reissues, Sound as Ever, Hi-Fi Away and Alley Daily, um, there's a little story that's written. In this case, it's by Rusty. I think in Hi-Fi Away it might be by Lee Ronaldo, interestingly, so I might dig that up. But uh, in this case, Rusty addresses, I guess, the not the elf in the room, but like the issue that sort of has been spoken about on message boards and things over the years. Um, how did it come about um, that Mark Tunnelly left and, and Rusty came into the band? Um, and I think, yeah, Rusty in this particular booklet, you know, does it really well, does it really sensitively uh, and appropriately. Um, so I'll just read out the snippet and, and we can sort of chat about it. But essentially Rusty had been, uh, according to the snippet, I won't read the whole thing out, he'd been in various bands um, and seen UMI and just was like in awe of them and like like I said previously, they were clearly the going to be a good band, a, f- a fantastic band. They looked the part, they sounded the part. Everything uh, was going for them. Uh, and Rusty was in a band in himself, but I don't think it worked out. And he had kind of given up on the, that dream, according to this. And he was, I think he was working at a record label at the point. So I'll just bring it in from there. Then one day, the call walking back into the office with a hand sandwich and a coffee in my hand i was greeted by my boss with a confused look in his face and the phone in his hand he said tim rogers is on the phone for you from new york after after uh, sorry (laughs) after some polite small talk and mention of a, a great bar called jones he cut to the chase they were considering asking mark to leave the band and if so would i be willing to perhaps take his place i was shocked I can't remember what I said, but stammering something in the affirmative. And he said, okay, mate, see you when we get back. As he turns the page in the little booklet. Ever the realist, my boss Dan counseled me not to get my hopes up too high. You and I had a drummer and for all I knew, the whole thing would be patched up and I'll be returned to where I, um, and I would be returned to the where, like I don't know what this is saying. You and I had a drummer and for all I knew, the whole thing would be patched up. And I'll be returned to where they are. Oh, that's right. I get it. And I would be returned to the where they are now. I think we got it. <laughs> it's embarrassing. Hey, uh, come on. This I can't is, uh, read. So you can do it. Thank you. You and I had a drummer, and for all I knew, the whole thing we patched up, and I would be returned to the where are they now file. A few quotation marks would have been handy there. Um, <laughs> Go on, Rusty. <laughs> like anyone on the scene, we knew the fractious nature of you and I's relationship on and off stage and had seen the bust-ups firsthand also like most people i took it for the group's trademark passion boiling over into flying cymbals fists and guitars 
It was one of the things that made them as great as they were. Besides, we agreed, Mark is a great drummer. And those are some very, very big shoes to feel. I thought he was right, of course. This is Dan, his boss. It was ludicrous to think I could step into the maelstrom. To be honest, I was completely wracked with self-doubt. If it was true, how in the hell could I step up to the plate and actually be part of this group? I was older, a few more shows under my belt than those guys, but still, it was a big ask and one I wasn't convinced I was up to. Then there was Mark, someone I'd known for a while who I respected as a player and knew that it would be controversial that he'd been replaced on the eve of the, the band's debut album. Julie, a tape, arrived from Ruart Records. Mark was indeed out of the band and there was an opportunity for me to hook up and play some songs with the guys. Early one morning at the office, I sat down before anyone else had shown up and placed it in the player. What I heard over the next 40 minutes or so solidified my resolve to be part of this incredible group. From the opening detuned blast of Coprolalia through draw-dropping immediate obvious singles like Berlin Chair and Adam's Ribs to down-home goodness like Trainspotten and Rosedale, this was an album that was head and shoulders above every other group on the scene. Through majestic tracks like Forever and Easy and Everyone's, Everyone's to Blame, the song I always ask to do every time we go out on tour, into the wide open spaces of Jamie's Got a Girl, and then into the solitary and singular Ordinary, a song that confirmed my hunch that Tim was indeed a proper songwriter. I was stunned to be I was stunned by the broken beauty and wordplay on display, by the near perfect chiming guitars that drove along on top of a wonderfully supple rhythm section, and by the sheer magnificence of the sound that this three piece produced. As the final chords of sound as ever rang out, I sat alone in the little office, stunned. Then I quietly whispered to myself, I'll do it. <laughs> sorry, yes. sorry for my reading. I can't read. Holy shit. Anyway. Uh, well, that's illuminating. And, uh, yeah, I'd always, just because I knew that Red Rusty's bio and another Perth boy, I believe, but, mm. um, yeah, just played – throughout tons of bands in the 80s and kind of like I'd assumed he'd he'd be more kind of like but it sounds like he was excited and kind of daunted to Mm. enter the fold and uh yeah some useful extra context especially kind of he would have listened to this and be like wow this is kind of the world I'm entering these are the songs that I'll be playing yeah exactly right and and so that gives you a kind of context to those questions that you asked early on so kind of how were they kind of seen in that in that scene and it seemed like they were they had a lot of hype at least that kind of the underground level i guess which is the only level that counts <laughs> scene respect baby that's what we do it for um <laughs> that's right. and what about what do you know of in terms of how was it how is this record commercially received and what has kind of like how is mm. the passage of time it seems like it's been favorable uh yeah because i I feel like i feel like with you know some let's take the vines highly evolved right Mm. you could that that is going to forever define them they could conceivably come out with if uh, not a bad example because it's not really a band anymore but like Mm. they could come out with a uh, an album that's objectively superior to that tomorrow and no one would give a shit it's still highly evolved forever and so Mm. i feel like with umi it's a little different Ali Daily, Hi-Fi Way will always be the kind of the heavier hitters. And I feel mm, like yeah. that helps a band in terms of the longevity of the debut record. Or it just it yeah, just makes you kind of it's more kind of like uh, a treasure trove. It's kind of like you you allow as opposed to like a classic, this album has to be perfect. Yeah. You can kind of look back on it with fondness and be like, Oh yeah, we were really young guys, as opposed to like, yeah, this this debut album has become um forever over blade and we were constantly trying to live up to those expectations so yeah anyway yeah. it's just a bunch of diatribe what well, what do you what do you feel like well what do you know about how it was in uh received at the time commercially and then well what, what do you feel like mm. the reception over time at least internally and externally has been yeah well it, i don't i couldn't find where it sort of entered the charts or anything the only reference i could find was that it was in the top 100 so it wasn't it wasn't like a a breakthrough from from like a mainstream perspective and obviously they they had subsequent number one hits from Ali daily through to number four record um but i think the way it's looked at now and i'm really proud we haven't used this word throughout this whole um <laughs> podcast but it's seen as like raw you know whenever you hear sound yeah. ever, people go oh it's raw um, and so I think that's how kind of people see it as in it's a bit, 
it's it's imperfect but really lovable and you know obviously has a an edge to it um and is of its time um and so i think it ended up winning an aria maybe for best independent release or at least it was nominated um so i think it it definitely signaled um that there was more much more coming from this band and i think people were pretty excited by it uh people in the know so and clearly you know the you know the way the record industry works from what i understand they probably sort of put the wheels in motion to to get ready for the next release which which turned out to be hi-fi way exciting stuff the beginning of a, yeah. a very special journey um Indeed. what let's do gold silver bronze in terms of the gold, tracks silver, bronze holy moly you did say this before but i totally forgot okay i'll i'll i'll, I'll give okay, you some time you. um i'll <laughs> Do a few jazz hands and a little twirl up here while so Thank you can you, think. But um yeah, so I'd I'd probably I would go gold. Let's go the other way around, um, mm. to for for a little bit of uh, intrigue and mystery. So I'd start with Ooh. bronze. I'd yeah. say sound as ever would be my bronze. Yes. Um my silver would be Berlin chair and my mm. gold would be uh Adam's ribs. The the Montreal nice. memories so I'm glad we we, we share them uh, yeah, to this absolutely. day, and um, yeah, that that's a track that I feel like, um, yeah, it's it's for me at least hits hits me in all the the right spots. So that that would be my my podium. How about yourself? Mm. Oh boy, this is so hard. I'm going to regret it. That's the only thing I'm, I'm certain of. I'm going to regret whatever I say. But let's start with bronze. I'm going to go Rosedale, number five, track okay. number five, Rosedale, silver. Oh. Silver, I'm going to go Coprolalia. Yep. Incredible Strong. Start to the record. And gold. I think I'm going to have to go everyone's to blame. Yeah, wow. That's, I think just the way, you know, this will change obviously over time, but as on this right date now. in late August or early September, <laughs> whenever we are uh, in 2022, everyone's to blame is my favorite track, track on sound as ever. Yes. I've left out Berlin chair. Yes. I've left out Adam's ribs. I already feel bad about it. Um, please don't at me. <laughs> is yeah, that a no, thing? Do people still at? Yeah. Yeah. No, they need your at to at <laughs> oh, yeah, you. That's, true. That, that's yeah. how it works. But, um, yeah. yeah, no, I feel like you're forever the company man here. You, you're trying to I, look, for, look at me. I've gone straight. I'm still, I'm still very much a fan. I've got lots of learning to do when for two, two of the singles here, and you've yeah. um you've gone like no this this guy's been working hard over here he needs <laughs> deserves a promotion, <laughs> and so uh, I feel like no that's that's uh yeah. no no one's gonna let's let's face this we're we're, uh, we're the only ones who care about these particular rankings maybe they'll change over time maybe in episode two if you feel like before we begin I I need to make a a change to my last uh podium oh, yeah, position. Okay. that's that's perfectly no. fine we can we this is podcasting man we can do whatever it's the fluid. fuck we want. Yeah. We can do whatever we want. No rules. All right. I think we did it. Episode one in the can. Um, all right. So, yeah, this is an interesting situation because we've we've recorded this. This is pretty much a pilot episode. Mm. I'm pretty certain when, when this is out, you're going to have uh, the ability to subscribe to the pod. We'll have links, what those links will look like. I don't fucking know. Uh, but they'll probably all involve ways in which you can kind of um, follow along and come along with us on this journey. So um, thanks for taking the time to listen to myself and Jono. And, uh, yeah, episode two, High Fire Way, dropping soon. Thanks for your time, buddy. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks all. Chat soon. <laughs>